So, welcome to the Open Education Week 2019. Thursday. Uh, today we are going to talk uh, about quality. <laughs> and first of all, I must underline that this webinar is planned and organized thanks to the joint involvement of, of Eden, NAP, which I represent, uh, Network of Academics and Professionals uh, within the Eden uh, Network, and Siege and Tell Group uh, representatives. Uh, the uh, head of, uh, of the Siege and Tell Group is actually also a speaker and a presenter today, Eva Ossianeston. Uh, and uh, during the webinar, we will mm, deal with different perspectives uh, regarding quality, uh, thanks to the participation of various experts uh, in the field. Moreover, quality models uh, developed uh, in two different Erasmus Plus uh, projects, open virtual mobility and digital culture projects will be uh, presented. Uh, in, in the next slide, you will have a, a look uh, uh, about speakers. Today, we have so many very important uh, uh, speakers participating, which I thank uh, from the very uh, beginning for their availability. They are also located in different parts of the world, so uh, please excuse us if uh, uh, something um, might happen during our one hour and a half um, uh, time. Uh, I won't go through uh, the details of everyone's background because they have a huge oh. and important uh, uh, background and CV and I would steal time uh, to their precious uh, uh, contributions today. Um, each presentation will last about 10, 10 minutes. Uh, we have one hour and a half um, in total, and comments and questions uh, will be discussed in the end. Please write them in the chat area because your microphones will not be uh, activated. Uh, be aware that the webinar uh, will be uh, recorded and accessible um, through the Eden website. So, thank you all. I give the floor to Svetlana Nyesteva. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Uh, and sorry if I didn't. Uh, but please, the floor is to you. Thank you, Svetlana. Mm -hmm. uh, hello, everybody, and thank you, Antonella. Um, uh, my name indeed is difficult to pronounce. Yeah. Knyazeva, and I'm from Russia, and I represent the UNESCO Institute for Information Technologies and Education, and um, I'm also an Eden Fellow. Uh, I changed the title of my presentation recently, and I will speak about the quality assurance in open online education, about OER and MOOC. Uh, I usually start my presentation from um, definitions of these two uh, acronyms uh, because I can see we have 29, 30 now participants and uh, I wish to be sure that if we are not at the same page, we are at least reading the same chapter. So open educational resources. Mm -hmm. Uh, these are teaching and learning materials that reside in the public domain uh, or have been released under an open license that permits uh, no-cost access, use, adaptation and re redistribution with, with no or limited uh, restriction. And massive online courses, so these are digital online courses, uh, accessible at special platforms and they can include videos, podcasts, 
tests, assignments, exercises, etc. Uh, so this is, they can be designed for a uh, huge numbers of students and some of them so uh, smaller number of students and um, well, uh, but these uh, courses are uh, only conventionally free uh, and open. Mm. Uh, when moving to uh, the quality of online education, and in particular speaking about open educational resources and uh, MOOCs, uh, I would like to mention two um, examples. One is the initiative of the European Association of Distance uh, Teaching uh, Universities. Uh, and. Um, so the uh, framework uh, included uh, the, the following main um, components. I will mention them briefly a bit later, but I, I am sure that many of the next speakers will uh, speak in more detail about, uh, well, these and other uh, quality assurance frameworks and uh, some of Many of them were involved in the, the projects and the initiatives. So uh, the e-excellence framework includes st strategic management, uh, curriculum design, cost design, cost delivery, staff support and student support. And very closely related to this is the uh, a, um, project uh, in, completed by the European Commission, the Joint Research Center, and this is Open Up Ed. And uh, within this project, they developed a, um, a quality label for massive open online courses. And uh, well, this framework also uh, includes the same components. So this is strategic management, curriculum design, cost design, cost delivery, staff support, and student support. But uh, well, this is as applied to MOOCs. So uh, uh, several years ago, UNESCO produced. Uh, a publication making sense of MOOCs. This is uh, this was a, a guide for policymakers in developing countries, and in uh, this publication, quality assurance uh, of uh, MOOCs uh, is considered as a two-way street. Uh, the quality assurance should assure that an um, institution goals for publishing MOOC are met and at the same uh, time the goals of individual participants in a MOOC are met. And uh, well, there are two concepts of quality. One is fitness for use, which assumes that there is a group of users each with uh, their requirements and expectations. And uh, the conformance with requirements, so this means the requirements of the institution over offering the MOOC and those of the learners. The criteria of uh, quality of MOOC can be divided into uh, several uh, categories. And well, the first one is, uh, well, it is not specific, it is characteristic uh, of learning in general because uh, MOOC is a course. So uh, regardless uh, of the fact uh, whether the material is offered uh, offline or online, uh, each, well, each uh, um, course uh, should meet uh, uh, certain requirements. Uh, uh, the second category is uh, the uh, criteria specific to online learning, uh, that learning materials should be designed with an adequate level of interactivity. And the third one is, uh, well, the category specific to uh, MOOCs, 
uh, which means that uh, specific as aspects of learning using a MOOC uh, should be addressed. For example, this is the size of MOOC, which uh, limits or determines uh, the uh, interaction between students uh, and teachers and uh, uh, between uh, uh, students. Um, to date, uh, well, there are no uh, uh, quality, national uh, quality frameworks for MOOCs, or at least we at UNESCO are unaware of those. Uh, I know some publications from Tasmania and from the UK, but uh, well, uh, the universities are still experimenting with the uh, quality assurance frameworks. Um, Actually, successful quality models uh, existing uh, or developed for online education uh, can be carefully adopted for MOOCs. That's it in brief. I, I think I have used my time already. Thank you. Thank you, Svetlana. You touched different points that are very, very interesting and that need uh, uh, attention from the community. I, um, I hope we'll have the time to discuss it later. So thank you to uh, Svetlana. And now the floor is to Abba Ossianesan, Eden Fellow, and as I said, uh, um, Chair of the Sigental a uh, group that uh, uh, worked together with NAP uh, in order to make this webinar uh, possible today. So how about the floor is to you? Thank you. So thank you very much, uh, Antonella, and uh, thanks for, for the pre-planning for this uh, event with Eden NAP and with Eden uh, Special Interest Group that would tell and quality enhancement. It's a great pleasure to, to be here and uh, to discuss this very interesting topic, which I really am interested in. Um, so uh, my task today um, uh, is about to talk mainly about the TIPS framework for open educational resources, which is one of the most uh, useful ones. One reason why I also choose this one was is because uh, that is um, that framework has an um, a holistic perspective and an ecosystem. So beside uh, the presentation from Antonella with me is, um, I can mention that um, I'm also uh, leading the ICD, International Council for Open and Distance uh, Education. They have uh, last year launched an uh, um, advocacy committee for open education resources, which I'm leading, and we are some 10 persons uh, over the world. And as uh, Svetlana mentioned, uh, e-excellence and, um, and the Open Up Ed uh, frameworks, uh, I also work together with EAD2U uh, as a quality reviewer for universities or for programs on open online learning and, uh, and MOOCs. And I was also in the editor board for the new manual, the third edition, which came out in 2015. It's available uh, on the web. Hmm. So um, as I was represented, uh, represent, uh, the Eden Sig uh, Tell Quality Enhancement Group, I will just uh, show you two slides about that. Uh, maybe some of you know um, that we have existed now for some years. It was launched in uh, 2016, if I remember right, and come to, come to you to uh, activities in 2017 at the Eden uh, Young Shopping Conference. Uh, we are some uh, ten people working in that group. Um, I'm leading it, and Ulf Ehlers, who is here as well today, he is also together with us in the, in the SIG. Um, this is the web page we have at the Eden web page, so please have a look uh, there if you have an interest. And 
please contact us also if you have an interest or questions or would like to join. Uh, we also uh, have set up a LinkedIn profile where we put some inf uh, information and um, discussions about uh, the issues of uh, um, the, the work we are doing with uh, talent quality enhancement. So please also um, have a look there and uh, contribute. You are most welcome. Um, I would like to start uh, to talk about the SDG4 because I think um, uh, you can't talk about OER nowadays without uh, talking about the sustainability goals. Because uh, open education resources and open education practices and open education culture and open education as such is very, very well stressed in the SDG4 uh, to ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and to promote lifelong learning opportunities for all. And open education resources, as I said, is specially mentioned to be one of the tools uh, to, give, uh, and to, uh, uh, to give access uh, possibilities for learning for all throughout life. And that was also one reason why uh, it was decided that uh, education should have an own in own uh, goal because it also influences all the other 16 development goals. Um, so the TIPS uh, framework, um, which was a collaboration from um, uh, Commonwealth of Learning and UNESCO, uh, is about uh, four pillars. I have added here uh, the model, which you maybe have seen, and also the, um, the, the book, the framework, where you can read more about it. It is available, of course, free for online. And um, the tips is about those four pillars. And that is the, the holistic perspective. You can't, oh, sorry, you can't um, just talk about the resources as such without talking about um, the other aspects of open education resources. And that is why open educational practices is maybe more relevant to consider because it is a, a, an ecosystem. And the, the resources is not just enough. So the T stands for uh, teaching and learning processes. Sorry. Uh, I stands for information and material content, P for presentation, product, and format, and F for system, technical, and technology. So what does, does that mean? Uh, it means then that you have to go beyond the, the resources and the materials as such. For teaching and learning processes, it is about pedagogical issues. And now we are discussing so much about um, Open education, open pedagogy is one of the, the issues. So here you can find that again. And it is about uh, including student learning, to have the, the learner not just in the center, but to have personal learning. And it is also about assessment and support. And as long as I will really argue, as long as we're not changing the assessment and, and the support, uh, we'll take time to change the mindset because it is all uh, going together and related to each other. Um, and when we, are, when we change the assessment, uh, then also uh, learning possibilities and the infrastructure for learning will also change, and of course the pedagogy. Uh, the I, information and material content, that is of course about the content as such, as was what we uh, more or less normally uh, talk about when we are talking about open education resources. It is about um, the content as such, about accuracy, about the relevance, about the up to date, about accessibility and all those kind of things. And of course about um, um, uh, up to date material and research based material and also user generated content and uh, the quality aspects about that. Uh, P for presentation, products, and formats. So that is about openness 
And again, you see it goes very well along to what we are talking about open education and uh, open access, about open pedagogy, the whole area of openness. Uh, it is about a different kind of uh, multimedia. Um, quite often, OER are text based. But here again, it says it's all kind of uh, variations on multimedia. It is about uh, design issues, how it is designed how it is accessed, and what kind of open format it has. And then the S is about system and technical and technology. There need to be an infrastructure which support the use of open resources. And that is also about um, the systems you are using and uh, how you um, both can produce, but also use really the, the 5R, uh, what is connected with open education resources. And as uh, Svetlana was talking about on Monday in her, her presentation, the sixth R, the real much I would like to add, and that is about recognition. So that goes here, here again. Um, there is another model by Khan, and uh, he says more or less the same, that there are those um, dimensions which I already have been talking about, about the TIPS model. It is about the infrastructure, about the management, about the content as such, about teaching and learning and pedagogy, and the assessment and evaluation. But we are also have those um, other aspects as uh, managerial, pedagogical, technological, financial, academic, ethical. And here again we see uh, the need and the requirements to have an holistic approach when you're talking about OER. It is not just about teaching and You need to have an organization in your institution. You need to have incentives for teachers and for students that are using it. And there need to be this recommendation. So there need to be a lot of things in place. Uh, and that is because uh, working with open resources is a different kind of approach, it, is a it requires a different kind of mindset towards the openness. And that is my, my last issue. And this is um, an image from um, Commonwealth of Learning, from Ikjan, um, I can't really pronounce his name. Uh, he's a good uh, colleague to me and uh, to all of us, I will say. Uh, currently, I work in quite a lot with him. Uh, but this model uh, from Commonwealth of Learning is how to go from OER and to OER practice to open educational culture. And the first, of course, you need to, uh, he, uh, they say again, you need to have another kind of mindset about what is learning about and how can you best um, provide uh, learning possibilities and to have this um, personal uh, approach just in time, just for me, just in place of learning. Uh, then, of course, they, you need to have the infrastructure again. It's very important. And um, it is about to have uh, incentives for teachers, for academics, to have rewards, for example, to, have, um, to be recognized, um, and also to have the infrastructure and have to support the repositories. So again, there is a long pathway which you have to work through if you're going to you really use the potentials of uh, open educational resources and to go move to open educational culture and practice. So thank you. Um, I think uh, my time is out now, so I would have to thank you so much, Hava. Uh, again very, very interesting presentation, um, especially the focus on, uh, on the need of, for a new kind of culture within open education, which is really the point, I think, but we'll have the time to discuss it later, I hope. And now, instead, we give the floor to host Daniel uh, Ellert, uh, Eden Fellow, and as uh, Abba uh, reminded uh, us uh, before, um, he is 
member of uh, uh, the special interest uh, group on on quality, and uh, it is going to uh, uh, tell us more about uh, um, current and future open education resources quality. Thank you, Hope, for being with us, and the floor is to you. Thank you very much. I hope that everybody can hear me. I am delighted to talk today uh, to all of you uh, and share some thoughts which uh, come a little bit from the past and are going into the future. Uh, it was a, a pleasure in preparation, actually, uh, to think a little bit about the future, and I therefore was uh, naming my presentation Current and Future Open Educational Resource Quality. And um, I'm uh, not sharing with you a, a particular framework. I'm just sharing with you questions I have and uh, some open, uh, opening the mind issues, maybe, uh, to discuss, really. So the problem uh, which I would like to address is that I think that the challenge with OER quality is that OERs are potentially created uh, as educational materials without knowledge of the context. And without knowledge about the learner and the context, quality cannot be established. Resource quality can. So I'm trying to distinguish um, in my thinking between learning quality and resource quality. And I think this is a, an important distinction in order to not think that we can raise the quality by creating wonderful learning artifacts through or with which learners then will start to learn. That can happen, that quality is rising, but it's not a guarantee. In the past decade, I think we can say 10, 12 years, uh, I have been involved in several, I think some of us uh, have been involved in several um, quality initiatives. Uh, the Open Educational Quality Initiative, for example, which was working on the issue of defining open educational practices uh, as the use of OER in order to raise the quality of learning. Uh, and what we can see is that there are many frameworks and many um, uh, initiatives working on this issue. And um, I always say that uh, the real challenge for an organization or for an educational group, a scenario, is to select carefully what you take on board in terms of frameworks, criteria, uh, so that the dimensions are really meeting your needs. Uh, we have, uh, together with the Joint Research Center, compiled a report in 2013-2014 to consolidate the body of knowledge which was existing uh, in the field of OER uh, and quality, quality for OER, that is uh, downloadable from the web. Uh, this slide is unfortunately not working like I had designed it, so you cannot see the report here, but uh, you can just try to Google JRC report on OER quality, then uh, it's going to show up. Um, if we think about quality, then we can, of course, see different perspectives. Um, and the old question, is learning actually a function of teaching, plays a big role here. Because if we say, yes, learning is a function of teaching, then that means that a good teacher uh, will evoke good learning. And then that means that a good resource will evoke, a good learning resource will evoke good, uh, good learning uh, with the learner. If we doubt this, and um, I can tell you right away that I am uh, very strong, in strong opposition to this question or this implicit statement, 
If we doubt it, then um, we have to ask the question, how is learning actually coming about? Who is responsible for learning and for learning quality? And of course, we know that it is always a multifactorial, uh, let's say, environment in which uh, many factors play together, the teacher and the learner and the educational context and so on. I think that in the history of uh, quality development, we can see that for some time we have been very much input focused uh, and also uh, in the history of OER, um, the, the history and actually also the actual, the, the actual time, the actual frameworks uh, are often, uh, let's say, prescriptive frameworks, which, which, so to speak, try to outline dimensions and criteria which should be met and then, uh, so to speak, um, uh, carry in them the the inherent um, uh, uh, conviction that quality will be raised if these dimensions are going to be met. And um, I always think that, that this is actually a good approach because we need scaffolds in order to be able to professionalize as education, uh, educationalists, to professionalize our view and our analysis capacity how we look at the educational scenario, how we are using OERs, what kind of OERs we feel are fitting for the target group or which might not be fitting for the target group. But in the end of the day, probably uh, learners will not automatically learn in a good way, not automatically achieve a high learning objective, a high qualitative learning experience only because we respect certain framework measures. For some learners that might work, for other learners that might not work. So I think the question is really the focus, um, where we put the focus when we discuss quality, is it quality of learning or is it quality of resources? And that's why I very much appreciate that I feel at least that the debate in the question of OER quality is moving from frameworks and prescriptive, this, uh, prescriptive uh, approaches in which we are uh, listing criteria into community-oriented approaches, uh, where it is stressed that through open learning, learners need to be um, guided in their autonomy, in their capacity to reflect, to learn, learning methodologies and so on, to become autonomous learners. And this is what I call the practice-oriented, the open education practice-oriented uh, quality uh, approaches. It's interesting if we uh, look at research, uh, how open education uh, resources are actually used. When, and we can see that, at least in this piece of research published two years ago, uh, we see that uh, there is actually not so much a, co a connection between the use of OER and um, uh, an innovative pedagogical design. So that means that OER and higher education actually are often used within the frame of very traditional pedagogical settings, which is also something we need to address because that again um, uh, emphasizes this underlying implicit quality uh, illusion or understanding that maybe a good resource is already enough and doesn't need an additional, very well-refined and good uh, pedagogical scenario around it. Just want to go through some slides very, very quickly because my time is already uh, ending. Uh, the higher education uh, environment, the education environment at large, is changing enormously where in the past we had a clear understanding that we could educate young people to become a professional in a certain field. We know today this is not possible anymore. Uh, rather, uh, this could be maybe rather better expressed in a, to say they can, of course, become professionals, but what a professional is, is changing uh, its meaning when we discuss future skills uh, very much. So the future educational scene is actually an open educational um, uh, scene scenario uh, because it's not a traditional model or a modern model 
uh, where we focused on mass education, the future will be a mass plus individualized, personalized uh, uh, model. And there is no way around uh, to go around um, uh, individual um, uh, content and uh, open educational resources. So open education and open educational resources are actually the new value proposition for learning and training. And uh, we have just shaped uh, a European network for catalyzing this approach, not only for higher education, but also uh, for businesses, actually. So now my time is up. Just come to the end. Uh, just to uh, let you know that there is um, uh, some material still on the web, reports and also guidelines uh, with, with which you can use in order to assess your institutions or also as a learner your capability uh, of um, uh, using uh, open, of being an open educational practitioner actually. And uh, the last slide. Uh, I think that, and, and that's a, bit, a little bit leaving now the room for discussion then, I think that we can actually uh, think the future quality approaches, they need to be quality approaches which, in which we are moving from control to culture, from inspection to inspiration, from a product-oriented view to process and competence-oriented view, and um, uh, from islands of learning to island hopping, uh, this thought is actually uh, referring to uh, the personalized connected learning works. So I'm just skipping the uh, other slides and then uh, thank you Thanks very much. To you. For your Thanks to you for uh, this very inspiring uh, presentation. Wolf, again, the, mm, lots of things to, to discuss together, I think. Uh, but let's uh, give everyone the opportunity to speak and then in the end we can um, start a brief uh, discussion. So now we, after this um, um, landscape vision about uh, uh, rules and about the possibility to, uh, to improve, to see the future of quality in OERs, we we drive our attention to some uh, examples, uh, some quality uh, models uh, devised within different uh, international projects. Uh, and I'm introducing the first one, which uh, will be presented by Gemma Tour Ferrer uh, from Universitat delle Illes Baleares. Uh, and she's going to uh, to tell us about a model uh, related to um, one of the Erasmus Plus projects presented today, Open Virtual Mobility, uh, and of course the quality model uh, device within the project. And her presentation is entitled Assessing the Quality of OERs, the Open VM Project. Thank you, Gemma, for being with us, and the floor is for you. Thank you, uh, Professor Pache, for the invitation. And um, thank you to all for uh, sharing such a nice and interesting session, which I am very pleased to, to share with all of you. So um, I'm presenting on behalf of the Open Virtual Mobility Erasmus Plus uh, partnership and um, um, I, I am happy to say that it is the, the perfect moment because we are doing uh, the first steps in um, um, making all, all the project happen. So we've been working hard and now we have uh, some of the first products uh, released. And I think it's the perfect moment to, to show what's, what's going on and the perspective of the, of the quality approach. Just um, a, sh a short note to present the, the project in itself. So it's about uh, virtual mobility and the open context. So um, we define virtual mobility as the set of ICT supported activities organized at an institutional level 
which um, realize or facilitate international collaborative experiences in a context of teaching and learning. But what we are trying to do is that uh, we are challenging all this by making this open and open as much as possible. This means opening the, um, the digital environment in which these virtual mobilities are um, developed and also opening the, um, the agreements, the, the formal agreements and the formal curricula that's normally or um, traditionally have been institutionally supported. But we are trying to redefine uh, a, des a design where both um, um, both agents, uh, institutions, professors, but also students can open the, the, the design. So, um, we have uh, three, three main tasks, uh, which are the promoting the virtual mobility skills and defining them and redefining them in the context of, of openness, and uh, creating a learning hub and the MOOC, and what I was uh, trying to, to introduce uh, in the very beginning was that the Learning Hub has just been released, and um, I'm happy that here Professor Andone, who is the team leader of uh, making this Learning Hub uh, open and visible for all of us, is here too, is sharing the session. And we have just uh, done a pre-pilot, and uh, the the new the new, the new pilots are also uh, going to be uh, open uh, very soon. And also we have here Professor Poche, who is the team leader of opening this MOOC. So I take advantage of this <laughs> to to also say thank you to them. And if they want to add any anything to what I am doing, so just please give us <laughs> your insights. And um, the third uh, the third aim is the recognition and open accreditation. So we are trying. Um, we also uh, want to. Um, accredited by the introduction of the open badges in, in this in this open environment. The project is really challenging, complex and uh, very um, uh, and very integrated. So the design of what our tasks are really planned and um, the, uh, I think I'm, I'm happy to say that this, uh, the schedule is going on uh, correctly as it was planned. So um, we already have the MOOC and so the, the working outputs 3, 4 and 5 are the things that um, are visible and then come into one integrated thinking, both the, the learning hub and the MOOC. And so then the output seven in which I, I work with our colleagues, um, it's the, we try to set up all this quality framework for such uh, a challenging project. Um, shortly, to, um, uh, to give the context to all this uh, quality framework. We were uh, really uh, concerned about all the approaches that the project was about. So um, we wanted to um, contextualize our work in the context of higher education, the open education, the virtual mobility, and of course the MOOC. So then we had the ENQUAR recommendations for e-learning in higher education, the open education framework by the uh, European Commission, the virtual mobility matrix by IATU, and the diverse models of quality for MOOCs that uh, are already um, published and, uh, and, and that, as we, that we have used. Um, we have tried to focus and uh, to highlight the pedagogical aspects of all this and as well the uh, and special focus to the autonomous concept of learning and in particular the self-regulated learning design. Uh, in particular for, for the MOOC but as well for the OER selection that we have been uh, working. 
Um, so um, we have um, like two main frameworks that we uh, refer for the Learning Hub and for the MOOC and then for the OER. So a general a general approach to the DBR to the quality process is the design based research model. So we want to go into a cycle of iterations in which we uh, design, develop, implement, and evaluate a product, uh, the MOOC, the OER, and inform this cycle, correct for new iterations, change, make improvements, and start again the new cycle. I think this is, this is really interesting because it tries to challenge, or at least it tries to tackle the problem of contextualization that uh, Professor Ehlers have just talked about. So I thought that uh, we, we were all, all in line about our presentations and our thoughts and the problems we see when talking about the quality in open education and, and OER. Um, this is the adaptation that we have uh, developed for our um, for, for our work, in which we have tried to simplify it, and the design and development is just one step because of the the importance of trying to be a bit more agile than DVR can can be as uh, at the first ones. Then um, we are also trying to have uh, the perspective of all agents. So it's not only uh, the assessment by the internal partnership, but also it's very important to have the, the, the approach of our learners, who in the end are the most important part of, of a quality process. And for the learners, we have a fit for proposed assessment, uh, um, which uh, I haven't added here, but it's really uh, op very open, so we can have as much as we can from their approach. Whereas for the internal partnership, we have based our quality assessment on an already existing model, very fresh, very new, and very complete. Uh, what we like about this model, it's uh, not only that it is very complete, but also because we like the processes in which it is based. So, in the end, the, um, the three processes that, um, um, the, the phases that the, um, this framework uh, works, it's more or less a bit about the phases of uh, the design, um, the design-based research. So uh, we highly recommend this resource as we think it is um, complete and um, as you can see here it is complete in dimensions and also it is uh, very interesting for the DVR sim similarities that uh, it is based on. And then we have OER for the OER. So, I'm my my time has no. <laughs> I have spent my time and I need to. No, please don't worry. Oh, Go ahead. Sorry. So a couple yes, of minutes. Can I have... Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Because the, uh, we have now the the OER coming. <laughs> I really wanted to to tell that the OER quality and the way we have addressed the quality in OER is based on a double process of uh, peer review, peer review for selecting the OER, but also, and this is very important, peer review for the assessment of 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 OER. For this assessment, we have also used an existing uh, rubric that has already been published and validated by uh, Boche, Agusti and Tre. And uh, it is very interesting because uh, we have different levels to assess three main characteristics, the quality, the appropriateness and the technical aspects that, uh, in brief, mean analyzing the, um, the context in which 
it, uh, this OER I created and then analyzing the context in which we want to use this OER. So I think these, these are two very important sides of the same, of the same problem and a, a way of uh, uh, challenging and addressing the problem of contextualization. So about the first thing, we, we need uh, this, uh, all these items, all these criteria, and this is analyzing the origin of the OER and uh, the, the author, the institution, the process in which it was created, and then the, the appropriateness for, for our own uh, context, uh, adapted to our levels and to, to our skills. Uh, in the end, uh, we need that uh, this, this adaptation, um, what, uh, we need to analyze what, what can we do with this, what's, um, what are the possibilities for edit and for the accessibility, and in the end, how are we going to design the assessment based on this reusage of the OER. And so again, another uh, another instrument which is uh, relevant and important for all the quality uh, approach that here I wanted to summarize in a figure and uh, as, um, the, as a main process highlighting again the, the VDR iterative cycle, all the references and just uh, a last second to say thank you again and honor to be here and sharing with you and uh, uh, available for your questions and thank you very much Jana, thank you so much and sorry for, for describing the project in in its all uh, and then focusing on on quality which is the topic we discussed today thank you again uh, and so, yes, as you might see, time is always running, so, <laughs> uh, but we now have another uh, very meaningful example uh, with uh, another uh, Erasmus Plus uh, uh, project model, and it is presented by Diana Andone, Eden Vice President for Communication and Communities and uh, uh, professor at Politecnica University of Timisoara, Romania. She is now speaking from U.S., so thank you so much, Diana, for your effort, because I know there is <laughs> very, very early in the morning, so thank you so much, and the floor is to you. I don't want to steal your time. Please. Thank you very much uh, to everybody and Antonella and all my friends, uh, which are some from Eden uh, Executive Committee, some from the European Erasmus Project in which I'm working, and Zaklana and Neil, with whom I've been, I know and been working for some time now. Uh, my slides are loading now. I'm hoping that you can hear and see me properly because my internet connection is very low and it's, uh, very early in the morning now, I'm in Mississippi, at the Mississippi State University in a hotel now. i just been until yesterday at the Tulane University in New Orleans. So I'm going to speak now about the DigiCulture project, and I hope that all the 50 participants which are there, some of them probably are also my students from Romania, which I also greet uh, from, from here, and uh, who probably will see that uh, this is something which relates also to the work which they are doing. So basically, uh, my presentation is about the open educational resources which we developed in the DigiCulture project, uh, which is an Erasmus Plus project about improving the digital competencies and social inclusion of adults in creative industries. The DigiCulture project uh, get, has several partners, uh, some present here, which is Antonella Poche, for example, but some which are not. Uh, and it's mainly focusing uh, for the creative industries, which includes uh, not only culture, but also media, advertising, um, architecture, and um, uh, digital media, a lot of other uh, sectors. So what we are mainly doing, we are doing a MOOC, a massive open online course about the digital skills, which is going to improve their digital skills based on 12 modules. They are going to be delivered through branded learning, 
and we are trying to encourage young adults in the creative industries to gain more digital competencies. The recent um, statistic from Eurostar shows that this is one of the lowest um, digital one one area which has the lowest digital competence uh, level. So what we are doing in terms of quality, obviously we have an e-assessment tool, which is a tool which will mainly assess uh, through peer validation and learner validation some of the context, uh, some of the context which which we are going to develop uh, in the project, and some is already done, and we are going at the end to. Um, issue open badges for digital skills, and all of them are under the Creative Commons license. But mainly I want to speak about the students as creative creators. You are probably uh, very familiar about the concept of Friedman and Malmon from 2013 about the creative creators, the students and the youngsters which can go the extra mile to provide and to do some more, um, how to say, work content and also value to, to the society, but uh, by doing a bit extra than, than their uh, normal uh, thing, the, their normal uh, work. So what we are going to do, we are trying to involve somehow the art and the technology sector by creating some virtual reality examples and some study cases. I have uh, here, unfortunately, some videos which are not working, and I will kindly ask Christina to share with you the YouTube um, um, files, so you can uh, also see some of them. The idea of student as uh, OER creators, uh, I need to be honest, is not part of the Erasmus Plus project. It's something which uh, we have done for several years now. This is the third year in which we are doing this, and is trying to involve students on creating a resource normally an educational resource, which also needs to be open, based on a specific topic which they've learned, researched, or analyzed during their semester. We pair them, in fact, they are paired automatically in a team based on the topics which we uh, so share to them as ideas on which uh, they can uh, do their open educational resource. What this develops for the students, they need to understand, research, analyze for a dedicated topic. They need to do this much more depth that sometimes is needed for, let's say, a normal exam or a normal educational activity in a higher education university. Why? Because they also need to present it in a different way, because they need to use multimedia creator tools to create either videos, either animations, or infographics to be able to present it in a more interactive and, um, let's say, video rich uh, um, way uh, to, to their peers. They need to understand also open education principles. One of, we keep doing studies in our university and, and see other universities with whom we are working, that uh, students, they don't really understand the concepts of open education, the concepts of Creative Commons licenses and how this works. So this is why we came with this, because the best way for the students to understand and to know and to, um, to how to say, to enrich their, uh, their experience in uh, higher education through open education is for them to produce open education. The, how is validated? They are usually validated by the peer evaluation. Their colleagues validate and they, are, they evaluate uh, the open education resources which they created. And also us as uh, teachers, as professors, we validate and evaluate them. Some of them are already in the Creative Commons, in the Wiki Commons area. Some of them are in some other project, uh, um, how to say, areas. Some of them are in our virtual campus, uh, uh, which is the Polytechnica University of Timisoara uh, online environment. This is a video which, unfortunately, uh, we cannot see. This is a video about Duolingo, about how to use Duolingo of communicating between uh, two different students which one is an Erasmus exchange student and the other is not, which is trying to learn, to, trying to learn a language. This is uh, an infographic, for example, another one uh, done by another student. This is a master student, uh, exactly like the previous uh, video, um, which is about the history of copyright and how uh, it evolved and what, what is doing with it. This is, for example, an area in Padlet where teams of students have shared 
what they have done in uh, using augmented reality or virtual reality on producing OLs, because I need to say that some of the OLs uh, which uh, we are using and the students create are also used using augmented and virtual reality tools as CoSpaces, uh, Unity, Orasma, Hyrio, Hi and several others. And this is the area where they share how they are doing it and what's their experience and what is the resource uh, information resource which they are using. And another example like this, I'm sorry, the image is probably moved a tiny bit. And this is, for example, something which they created in CoSpaces, which is a very friendly and easy to use um, method for creating virtual realities in the classroom, as it is also says in, uh, in their advertisement. But uh, it's quite friendly for everybody to, to use, so the students quite, uh, quite, uh, quite know how to do it. As I already mentioned, our project mainly is about digital culture, and we are trying to improve the knowledge and the images about uh, the city of Timisoara in this case. And this is the Timisoara Cathedral presented in uh, virtual reality. And this is, you can see through uh, VR uh, glasses or through a simple mobile phone using uh, a specific application. Similar about uh, Liberty Square in Timisoara, which is in both ways using VR and also augmented reality. And all of these have been created by, by the students in the, at the undergraduate uh, uh, degree in multimedia. At the end, for example, this year, we asked all of the students to evaluate their experience on creating an OS. I will uh, like to direct to your attention that uh, the result is very positive. Obviously, in the middle is the highest score. They somehow agree, somewhat agree that uh, creating the OR was fun. It was also useful and encouraged uh, peer collaboration, but it was also difficult uh, to create. They face several uh, challenges uh, by doing this, but they overcome that. I need to say that all the students have uh, submitted the OS, some at a better quality. Uh, we were using, in fact, Christian Strache a method of uh, quality evaluation of, the, of their OS, but quite a lot of them have agreed. Would they strongly agree with the thing that this activity helped them to learn new things, which is the most positive, uh, probably, result which we have from this uh, project uh, now. At this moment, we have 100, around 100 OS created by, by students, which are all validated at uh, good quality, which are all under Creative Commons license and uploaded either in uh, Wikicommons or in other, other platforms. My suggestion uh, is to challenge also students and also us as educators to collaborate to be more innovative, to learn to be open, and to become more open students, and at the end to create. And I'm using an image from Mardi Gras, uh, which was just two days ago here uh, in the United States in New Orleans, where you can see people are sharing things. They are sharing trinkets <laughs> to the screaming audience uh, downstairs. And you can relate that the audience is our worldwide audience, which is looking forward to see more information, more, uh, how to say, engaging materials, and more good quality open educational resources. Thank you very much, and I hope I will be able Thank to see so questions. Thank you so much, Diana. Again, lots of inputs uh, for, for discussion. Uh, I'm, I really like this idea uh, that is coming out uh, from our um, from your presentations regarding self-assessment, sharing, peer evaluation, all issues that uh, uh, drive them in, in the direction we uh, mentioned uh, uh, before regarding the need for individualization. So thank you so much, Diana. I hope we'll have the time to, to discuss uh, all together in the end about uh, what came out of your presentation and now we really uh, welcome uh, Neil uh, Butcher from the World Bank uh, South Africa. Uh, Neil was uh, uh, 
uh, very kind in uh, being available today because we know he was uh, already engaged on the mobile learning week, uh, giving another presentation. So thank you so much, Neil, for being with us. Thank you. Uh, thank you again. And he's going to introduce uh, uh, his presentation entitled Developing New CPD Models for Effective OER Practices in African Higher Education. So again, another um, another opportunity to know more about a different uh, context. Thank you so much, Neil, for being with us. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I hope I'm audible. I've had to come back to my hotel room from. <laughs> I made it. Yes. Uh, no, no, we we hear you okay. first. Great. So um, I'm going to talk very briefly about a totally different aspect of quality, uh, but it's something that uh, is become increasingly important to us in the work that I do with an initiative called OER Africa, um, where we focus particularly on, on what we call effective OER practices. Um, one of the things that I've discovered participating in the OER community over the years is that very often people seem to make the mistake of assuming that just because there is use of OER, that equates with good quality pedagogical or educational practices. Um, and there's not a sufficient interrogation of what the actual quality of the educational practices using OER are and, and whether or not they're actually leading to improved experiences for the students. So as part of our engagement with African universities, um, we, we've really noticed that despite all the talk and the rhetoric and the push by IGOs like UNESCO, effective OER practices really aren't um, disseminating especially well through African universities. Um, and we think that this is specifically linked to a very large scale need for professional development not around OER and open licensing itself, although those are obviously things that need to be learned, but actually around basic pedagogical and cognitive skills and competences. So our, our, our experience is that people are massively overestimating, in fact, the level of pedagogical skill and knowledge of the typical academic in an African university. I'm speaking specifically about Africa because that's where we're working, but as I've traveled around the world, I think that this is actually also a global problem. It's not just a problem in, in Africa. And I think a lot of it is just linked to the assumption that academics can teach. A lot of it is also linked to the emphasis that's still placed on research rather than teaching and learning uh, for career development purposes and so on. And then in connected to that, when we are investing in continuous professional development, um, predominantly the models being used for CPD are still formal courses or else face-to-face -face workshops, both of which are very expensive and very hard to scale. You know, Africa consists of uh, thousands of universities and tens or hundreds of thousands of academics. So, so to scale face-to-face -face workshops as a CPD model across all of them is clearly not going to be affordable in a context of resource constraints. So what we've been engaged in, in the last year and are continuing to engage in, in partnership with the Association of African Universities and the African Libraries Association is to investigate in much greater detail whether there might not be alternative professional development models uh, that would help people to develop these kinds of competences uh, and then through that be able to improve the quality of their OER practices. So what we did is went back, ra rather than starting with OER, we went back to uh, talk about specific pedagogical skills that we think are important. Um, and we identified six core areas which are listed on the slides there. I'm not going to go through them all. Um, but then we've unpacked each of those and, uh, and tried to understand, first of all, what would it take for a person to be good at effective learning design? And then understanding from there what role OER might play in that. So if I move on to the next slide, you can see just one example of that. So here we have effective learning design for program and programs and courses. We've unpacked to give an indication of what core competences we think an academic might need in order to be able to do effective learning design. 
And then we've linked to that the different ways in which OER and, and OER practices can contribute to effective learning design. And we think that that extra step is really important and it's very often missing from OER discussions on quality. So people assume that if you're using OER, then that's a good quality educational practice. But we think by unpacking it in this way, and we've done this for all six of the learning area, the, the, the six core areas of pedagogy we identified, um, we think that's hopefully a more helpful way of thinking about uh, professional development around the use of OER. What we are then doing at the moment is piloting together with uh, various universities on the continent and also through our partnership with AAU and AFLIA, the design and implementation of a series of standalone tutorials which are designed to be very granular in, uh, in scope. Um, so if you look at this particular diagram, each one of the blocks that you see uh, reflected here is a standalone tutorial. Each of them takes probably no more than 25 to 30 minutes to complete. Um, and what we've tried to make sure is that if an academic comes in and actually completes one of these tutorials, they will immediately be able to take away with them something of concrete and practical relevance and use that they can take into their uh, classroom practice, into their teaching and learning practices in their university, and it will immediately bring benefit to them. So for example, uh, we've got one module there uh, on the Google advanced search, which has been very, proved to be very popular because the vast majority of academics, unfortunately, appear not to even be aware that Google has advanced search facilities. So by teaching them about them, we, on the one hand, we're able to teach them about open licensing, but on the other hand, we're able to give them a practical skill that they immediately can take away and start using to improve the quality of their research searches, their teaching and learning, their OER searches, and everything else. But if the academics then accumulate the, the knowledge across all of these tutorials, then they will have gained a much broader level of knowledge around finding open content. And we piloted this one learning pathway. What we're expecting to do over the course of the next two years is to build out another six to eight uh, teaching and learning pathways of this kind, and then work with AAU and AFLIA to see whether or not this model of professional development can actually scale effectively. Um, so we are very much hoping that if this can be successful and if it gets traction with academics, it can provide one important piece of the puzzle of quality of focusing on helping academics in a practical, simple, straightforward, and very cheap way um, in enabling academics to learn some critical skills around OER and around effective pedagogical practices that don't require them to travel long distances to spend three or four days in a workshop or to register with a formal course. Um, and we're then hoping to embed these in the CPD strategies of both AAU and the African Libraries Association. Um, so what I just wanted to do today is to highlight the link between quality in OER and effective continuing professional development and to flag what we think is the importance of different models of CPD to complement the mainstream models of professional development. Um, and hopefully the experiences that we're gaining from this will prove useful over the course of the next two years. So if anyone's interested in partnering with us as we move forward with this project, we'd be very interested in exploring working with you as we do this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Neil. And actually, yes, um, I, I have different ideas uh, about the possibility of cooperating. Uh, and now, um, I w before going to to my own brief uh, brief contribution related to um, the next incoming uh, uh, conference, Eden conference in Bruges. I just wanted to, to you know, because time time is is running. Uh, I just want to collect some ideas from all the presentation that we had today uh, regarding uh, quality. Um, we we started with Svetlana, and Svetlana highlighted a concept that I really uh, appreciated: the idea that anyway, um, OERs, open education, is related to um, course development, and so um, of course uh, quality and rules, and in a way. 
uh, frameworks uh, and pedagogy and so on and so forth should be at the center of our of our attention of course anyway besides uh, besides uh, recommendations uh, frameworks and so on and so forth and this concept uh, um, was developed uh, by Habba when she said that we need a different culture we need to spread uh, this different culture and actually uh, Neil uh, himself uh, underlined this this idea that a new uh, culture should be um, spread and professional development should be cared of. Um, Ulf, of course, gave us uh, the line, uh, the line that everyone in a way developed because he told us that actually uh, we need uh, to focus on individualization, on student-centered learning, but especially on this idea that the quality is directly connected to uh, personalization uh, of learning, and so uh, we need to be careful when we when we choose or when we. Um, uh, design our courses working in an open uh, environment. Uh, the, 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 the models we, we, we took as examples are, are, are all in, in this direction actually because both uh, uh, the OpenVM project and Gemma's presentation highlighted these aspects uh, um, underlining and highlighting the design-based uh, research approach that we try to develop in, in this project. But of course, uh, Diana um, uh, told us uh, even more with uh, the other project, the DigiCulture uh, project, um, telling us about uh, uh, self-assessment, peer assessment, this idea of having the students as uh, OER creators uh, uh, themselves. Uh, and then uh, Neil, who, who, who told us, uh, and I'm going back to this, this concept, this idea of professional development, which is absolutely central and which is uh, what we really uh, care about in our, in our network of academics and professionals. In fact, as I said, this, this uh, uh, webinar was promoted and uh, uh, made uh, possible by the work of uh, the NAP uh, in uh, uh, joint connection with the CGENTEL um, group uh, coordinated by EBA. Um, if we go to the slide, uh, uh, that I prefer and that is related to the road to Bruges. Thank you so much, Christina. Uh, we, can, we can see that our next conference will be, as you know, I think all of you know, and all the ones who are there, and I know there, there are lots of people that um, uh, will be uh, in Bruges next June from the 16th to the 19th. And on that uh, occasion, um, during the conference, of course, you will have the chance to, to, to meet uh, lots of colleagues, different uh, academics and professionals uh, working within um, common and shared uh, um, scientific interests. But uh, on that uh, uh, conference, we will have also the opportunity to, to meet uh, in, uh, again, in a different way to, to support this professional development that Neil was mentioning. Because the NAV, the Network of Academics and Professionals, will organize uh, uh, a workshop uh, in workshop build on, built on uh, the speed dating uh, framework. So uh, this is um, a, a, a framework that we started uh, last year in Genoa during the Genoa conference and that we, we kept on offering 
uh, in Barcelona and now we are going to have it in, in Bruges where um, based on this uh, speed dating uh, idea we, we try to put uh, people and groups uh, uh, through uh, and we start discussing common interests, common research interests in order to build up on this uh, uh, short uh, meetings, but mm, very effective meetings. From uh, last uh, uh, workshop, we had the opportunity to build up new groups and, and so start new projects, new researches, and so on and so forth. So uh, I, I'm sure and I, uh, I look forward to meeting you all uh, in Bruges. Beside that, I am looking uh, in the chat if um, I can see uh, some questions. We have 10 minutes, uh, about 10 minutes for questions. So let me check if there's, uh, um, there's something in the chat. Uh, I've seen one uh, question that I can uh, I can report to all of you. Hmm? I don't know if there are others. Uh, um, anyone, anyway, this question is, I think, is addressed to all of you. And it says, that, um, in the quality assessment uh, procedure, uh, how can you um, coordinate uh, the different feedback coming uh, from different stakeholders. Uh, I think the, the, the question was asked by uh, Francesca from Roma and she, she if I interpret it correctly, uh, she would like to know how you manage in finalizing different perspectives and different needs uh, um, when you get feedback. From, from the different stakeholders. So I don't know who wants to start. Maybe Svetlana who was the first to speak. No? Ah, uh, here, is, here is Svetlana, please. Question and well, uh, from my um, point of view, well, I. I am sure I was talking about uh, quality assurance for open educational resources and MOOCs and for this particular field in which I am working. So uh, I believe that quality models should be developed for every component of a course or a, a, a module of open educational resources and if we speak about MOOCs this is for example identity management and this is pedagogy and this is assessment and this is credentialing etc and uh, well actually I don't have an answer how this uh, can be integrated into one system so I hope that our, well my peers will Provide Thank some you. additional information. Gemma? Please. Maybe, maybe yeah, I, please. I could try to answer, but um, but the fact is that we haven't started this process of crossing the feedback from both the stakeholders. The plan is that um, we, we will try to do this. For example, I have noticed that um, in the first round, but only uh, in an observational way, I mean, without having been um, uh, very strict, uh, I have noticed, for example, that the students uh, have enjoyed uh, video-based uh, OER, and that in the selection of OER in some pre-pilots, um, there are quite uh, a few um, video, but also we have increased the um, OER, the, the ones that are text-based. So now I think in the DVR process we will have to ask ourselves 
and review if um, text-based OER um, are needed as much as we have introduced them so far. So I think uh, we will have to do this referencing, this cross-referencing of feedback, and it will have to be um, 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 caref a, careful, um, a careful process because there is information which can be really relevant for the quality of the final learning design. Yeah, yeah, I think I know so. This helps. It helps a lot. Is... And, uh, yeah, please, Emma. I can continue. Uh, I can continue. I think it is a good, uh, a good question, but um, also in one way um, rather impossible to answer because there is not just one model or one framework fits all. I think we all have um, given the perspectives that um, there are so many uh, dimensions of uh, OER and opening up education. And we, I think also all of us have um, really stressed the importance of um, uh, the change in the mindset towards uh, open education. And then there are so many aspects and dimensions in that. And there are also so many, um, many uh, stakeholders. We have the learners, we have the institutions, we have the society, we have, I mean, a very, very broad uh, group of stakeholders. So there's not just one framework. But I think it is very important, and I think we all also have said that, that um, you need to have this holistic approach. And what Neil was really stressing, and that was um, also when I saw that in, um, in some of the the feedback I have, uh, the, the model you have uh, developed in South Africa, I was immediately interested in, in that because I think really um, to, to change the culture, to change things, we need to work with people because in the end of the day it is about people. And that is why it's so important with um, professional development, how it is used. It's not too responsible as such, but how they are used in what context and how you can make them towards. Thank you. Thanks to you all. I think we are going, uh, we are running out of time. But um, these uh, these issues, as I said, will be core aspects of the next uh, uh, conference in Bruges, and we will all have the opportunity to to have talks and discussions regarding these issues, these very important issues, and also. Uh, do not miss the opportunity for you or for your colleagues in your institutions to uh, access this webinar, but other webinars and the hidden charts to, um, that we are offering as uh, hidden and network of academics and professionals in particular. Uh, the new term uh, just Started. There's a very interesting and rich program out there. You can read it on the Eden website. And so this opportunity for professional development will be uh, there for anyone who is interested uh, already from next March the 20th. So I'll wait for all of you at our uh, virtual events, but especially on our face-to-face -face event that will take place in Bruges uh, next uh, 16th, 19th of June. Thank you so much for being there. Thank you for your availability participation from all these different countries around the world. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Thank you.